the most deadly accidents in aviation. I just knew that the plane had crashed. We have invested millions in avoiding them. Anything can happen anytime to anybody in a blink of an eye. Aircraft collisions. We show how a misunderstanding causes the world's worst aircraft disaster. How a crash over Los Angeles leads to new technology that should have made flying safer. How technology meant to avoid collisions leads to a tragic mistake, causing a grieving father to commit murder. Because every time we attempt to solve the problem, we seem to unearth another. Sometimes the solutions even create whole new problems. He went up into the air, exploded, and hit 1,500 feet down past us. How can we stop planes colliding? Los Angeles International Airport. LAX is one of the busiest in the world. It's a beautiful day, and the sky over LA is unusually busy. Among the planes is a light aircraft, belonging to William Kramer. Another is Aero Mexico Flight 498 from Mexico City. As the Aero Mexico flight enters LAX airspace, so mistakenly does the Kramer's light aircraft. At 11.52, a shudder passes through the Aero Mexico plane. Almost immediately, it goes into a nosedive. This picture is taken at the time. The pilots fight for control but unbeknownst to them, they've collided with Kramer's plane. Their aircraft has lost its tailplane. It lands in the suburb of Cerritos. Gary Durian is one of the first firefighters on the scene. A whole block that's right in front of me here was basically engulfed with flame. It was hard to tell that there was actually a house there. You could see maybe some remnants of a car in the main impact area. In the aftermath, the aviation industry has to face one big question. How, on a clear day with perfect visibility, can two planes collide? If you can't rely on pilots seeing each other, how can you ever avoid collisions? The battle to stop planes colliding is littered with lessons half learnt, or technological solutions designed to solve one problem that have sometimes unwittingly led to another. As a result, there have been a series of terrible disasters. The story begins 10 years earlier, over the skies in Europe. As BA Flight 476 leaves London for Istanbul, the horror of mid-air collisions is about to be brought home to the people of Britain. On board the half-empty flight, of 54 passengers. Several hours later, the aircraft enters Yugoslav airspace. A 
At about the same time, coming in the opposite direction, is a DC-9 charter flight, Adria 550. It's taking 108 holidaymakers home to Germany. Both planes are due to come under the command of air traffic controllers in Zagreb at about the same time. The sky over the Croatian city is one of the busiest in Europe. To prevent collisions, the airspace is divided into three different sectors by altitude. The lower sector is below 25,000 feet. The middle sector is from 25,000 to 31,000 feet. And the upper sector is above 31,000 feet. Each sector is handled by a different controller. It's absolutely crucial that when an aircraft moves from one sector to another, both controllers understand exactly what's going on. That day, as the BA and Adria flights near each other, the Zagreb controllers are pushed to their limits. Mladen Hochberger was an upper sector controller at the time. He remembers the job could be very demanding. There were times when, because of the state of our equipment, we couldn't do our job properly. On the BA flight, by contrast, all is calm. The first officer is even doing a crossword. Four across, healthy, five As the aircraft approaches Zagreb at a cruising altitude of 33,500 feet, the pilot radios its position. Uh, 476 is uh, Klagenfurt 02, 330, estimating Zagreb at 14. The call is taken by 28-year-old Gradimir Tasic, the man responsible for the upper sector at that time. He's working his third consecutive 12-hour day. Bob Trott is an air traffic controller and trainer. Working three days in a row and 12-hour shifts in each day with no break for three hours or so would make things pretty intolerable. There are multiple tasks. You're listening to the radio, you're looking at the radar display, you're writing on flight progress strips, you may be inputting data into computer. Tasic acknowledges the BA call and moves on to another aircraft. But at about the same time, Adria 550, flying lower at 26,000 feet, contacts the middle sector controller for permission to climb. Zagreb, flight 550, flight level 260, requesting higher. Permission is granted by the middle sector controller, who passes the information to Tasic. It's now that the stress on Tasic shows. Overstretched, he's lost sight of the fact that a new plane is about to enter his airspace. All of a sudden, the Adria flight appears on his screen. He's caught completely by surprise. The absence of a proper handover was tantamount to saying things are going to happen. The controller is on a nightmare scenario where an aircraft suddenly calls him. He doesn't know who it is, what it is, and if it is in conflict with another aircraft of his, he has no way of knowing. Seconds later, the Adria and BA flights are closing on each other at a combined speed of over 1,000 miles per hour. Finally, Tasic realizes what's happening. Frantically, he tells the Adria flight to stop climbing. Adria 550, descend immediately, flight level 30. But it's too late. The Adria flight's co pilot's last words are caught on the cockpit voice recorder. One minute! Goodbye! Goodbye! Three seconds later, the two aircraft collide. Mladen Hochberger was one of the air traffic controllers that day. 
After about 15 minutes, we heard people yelling, crash, crash, crash. It's difficult to describe. It's worse than someone telling you your wife has died in a car crash. The situation was terrible. It's impossible to describe a nightmare, a real nightmare. Wreckage from the two planes lands near the Yugoslav town of Vrbrovic, 16 miles northeast of Zagreb. All 176 people in the two aircraft have died. Are you the in Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. <laughs> Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bealy now. In Croatia, flags are flown at half-mast. Six air traffic controllers are arrested, including Hochberger. How could such a catastrophic collision have occurred? Everybody was concerned about his or her own situation. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to our careers? After two months in jail, Hochberger is released. But the upper sector man on duty, Gradomir Tasic, is sentenced to seven years jail for failing to do his job. It was horrible. We were all frightened. It's every controller's nightmare. It's not something that happens to a lot of people. Thank God. But soon, a more complicated story emerges at the inquiry. It's clear Tasic was grossly overworked and his sentence is halved. The air crews also come in for criticism. The BA co-pilot should not have been doing a crossword at the time. He should have been looking out for trouble. Most importantly, the inquiry argues the pressures of the job should be better recognized, and the working hours of air traffic controllers strictly limited. In certain areas, people will not work more than one and a half hours, and even if they exceed that, the general premise is that they should not work for more than two hours without a break. The Zagreb disaster highlighted the two basic communication issues that contribute to collisions. One is visual. Pilots should be looking out for other traffic. The other is verbal. Tazic had simply not grasped the middle sector controller was trying to inform him that a handover was taking place. Neither of these issues is fully dealt with and will come back to haunt the world of aviation. As a result, there will be more aircraft collisions. The Canary Islands, one of the world's top holiday destinations. But one spring day, there's a problem. On March 27th, the island's main international airport on Las Palmas is shut by a bomb scare, and planes are being diverted to the tiny airport of Los Rodeos on Tenerife. One of these diverted planes is KLM Flight 4805 from Amsterdam, a 747 jumbo with over 200 passengers on board. Many are young families looking forward to a holiday in the sun. Another diverted plane is Pan Am Flight 1736 from Los Angeles via New York. It's another 747 jumbo. Most of the passengers are on their way to a much look forward to cruise. But Los Rodeos is ill-equipped to handle the extra traffic. 
there's just a single runway and a parallel taxiway, with a number of smaller taxiways linking the two. As the aircraft wait to continue their journey, they're crammed haphazardly along the taxiway. On the Pan Am flight, it's been a long and exhausting journey. Dorothy Kelly was a junior purser on board the flight. She remembers trying to help her elderly passengers. We spent at least two hours, I think, on the ground. People were tired, they, they were milling around. We didn't have much food left. We gave them what we could to find, to eat, to drink. They wanted information and there was none available. We just didn't know what to tell them. Finally, after three hours delay, the KLM flight is instructed to prepare for takeoff. The aircraft's captain is Jacob Van Zanten. He's instructed to taxi up the main runway, turn around and wait for clearance to take off. Four minutes later, the Pan Am flight is told to follow suit. But the Pan Am pilot is instructed to turn off before the end of the runway and wait for the KLM flight to take off. Suddenly, fog descends on the airport. Bob Bragg was the co-pilot on the Pan Am flight. He remembers they had got about one third of the way down the runway. And a fog bank came off the southern group of hills, rolled down and stopped right on the runway. And the visibility went from unlimited to less than 500 meters. With visibility this low, the two planes can't see each other. And the air traffic controllers can't see them either. One, three, two, zero, uh, taxi echo. Back track and line up. But as the KLM flight now maneuvers at the end of the runway, Captain Van Zanten is impatient to make up time. He orders his first officer to tell the control tower they're ready for takeoff. Tenerife Control, this is KLM flight 4805, requesting takeoff clearance, over. What happens next is unclear. A record of the radio conversation between the control tower and the pilots seems to show the KLM first officer signing off with the words, We are now a takeoff. Or does he really say, We are now a uh, taking off? Zero five. Whichever it is, a recording from the cockpit voice recorder shows Van Zanten cuts across him. We're going. We're going. It's now there is a critical communication error. The Spanish controller replies, OK. OK. Van Zanten takes it as permission to roll forward for takeoff. But it's a misunderstanding. The air traffic controller immediately adds, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. This second part of the message is lost in radio static, and Van Zanten doesn't appear to hear it. Meanwhile, invisible in the fog, the Pan Am flight is still on the runway. The captain had the airplane slowed down to about three knots. And we were following the center line, just taxing down the runway, but very slowly. As the KLM Jumbo now gathers speed, it can't see the Pan Am 747 bang in front of it. Suddenly, the Pan Am crew see the lights of the KLM aircraft bearing down on them. 
he was coming very quickly out of stand the runway. That's the only time in my life that I have ever seen anything I didn't believe was happening. The Pan Am crew apply full power. Get up, get up! And take a sharp left turn off towards an exit. At the same time on the KLM plane, Van Zanten desperately tries to lift off the ground. But it's too late. I basically closed my eyes and ducked. All of a sudden, I saw things flying around. I thought, oh my god, we've been bombed. Then everything started moving in slow motion. Both aircraft had been ripped into pieces. Even those who'd been on the scene through the hours of darkness were shocked by the carnage. The final death toll is 583 people. It's the biggest loss of life in aviation history. The pictures can show this horror they can't convey the stench of the dead of the smouldering still of the two aircraft. Well, I think we can uh, safely state that this is one of the saddest day in our history. Yet, incredibly, 55 people on the Pan Am flight survive. Among them are Dorothy Kelly and Bob Bragg. You think to yourself, why me? It took me probably three days to comprehend what had happened. Dorothy Kelly survived with a black eye and head wounds, but is still emotionally marked by what happened to her. It has changed my personal life. Anything can happen anytime to anybody. And it doesn't matter who you are surrounded by or how much money you have. Uh, or how healthy you are, or young you are, it can happen in a blink of an eye. In the following months, there are many bitter lessons to be learned. The final inquiry attributes some of the blame to Van Zanten for not waiting for an unequivocal go-ahead to take off. But the most important legacy is sweeping changes to the language used by crews and controllers to communicate. The standard of your English has to be checked as competent. Diamond 204, climb to flight level 8, sir. Not just in conversational, ordinary conversation, but in air traffic control and particularly in areas where incidents take place out of the ordinary. There's also a push to tighten up the terms and expressions used. Captain Chris Clark trains airline pilots. Lots of the old expressions like OK and Roger uh, were discontinued and banned. From now on, controllers must use the phrase line up and wait as an instruction to aircraft moving into position on the runway. Now, before this, he may have been told just line up or OK or enter the runway. And those terminologies are open to some um, misunderstanding, particularly if the English is a little bit poor. Finally, the phrase, take off, should only be used when the final takeoff clearance is given. It used to be that the pilot, when they were ready to take off, would say to ATC the phrase, ready for takeoff. That was changed to say, ready for departure so that the actual word takeoff was only ever used by the ground station when they said clear for takeoff. By the late 1970s, verbal communications between pilots and air traffic controllers have significantly improved. But this is only solving part of the problem. 
Another clear lesson from Zagreb and Tenerife is that to avoid collisions, pilots need to look out for each other. But it's a lesson never properly learned. It was the failure of the pilots to see each other that leads to the disaster at Los Angeles Airport in August 1986. At 11.42, Aero Mexico Flight 498 collides with a light aircraft and crashes into the suburb of Cerritos. All 67 people on both planes die. Five homes are destroyed and 15 people on the ground are also killed. Mary Misrock is waiting for her husband and three children to return from a holiday in Mexico. So I was waiting in the international terminal and uh, waited and waited. You know, it was way after the time that they should have showed up. Finally, she's told to go to another part of the airport. But when I got in the elevator, I just knew that the plane had crashed. For some reason, I mean, there was no other reason other than I just had a feeling. All the bad things go through your mind. It was surreal. It's just surreal. The devastation is so total, it's hard to identify the victims. Uh, my husband was not identified for a couple of weeks. The way that the plane came straight down, um, most of the bodies were basically disintegrated. It was hard for us to decipher if it was actually part of a person or not. The deadly accident at last drives home the message that you can't rely on pilots to see each other. There are just too many distractions. As a direct consequence, during the 1980s, the accident leads to the widespread introduction of an extraordinarily clever piece of new technology. It's called TCAS, the Traffic Collision and Avoidance System. TCAS relies on a clever piece of technology called a transponder, a device that both transmits and responds to radio signals. When two aircraft approach each other, their transponders lock on and start to talk to each other. Terry McHattie trains pilots to use TCAS. The transponders of these aircraft interrogate each other many times a second, and in so doing, create a three-dimensional radio bubble around each aircraft. If at any time it senses those two bubbles may come to be too close for comfort, TCAS will generate various warnings to which pilots must react. An approaching plane will show up as a white diamond. And as you can see, we've got traffic here below us, but climbing, as indicated by the arrow. It's now 600 feet below us. The radio bubbles are too close for comfort. The white diamond changes to an orange circle and TCAS flashes up a warning. Traffic, traffic. OK, that's now a traffic advisory, 500 feet below us and still climbing. If the situation gets serious, the orange circle becomes a red square and TCAS orders the plane to change course. OK, Climb. it's now a resolutionary advisory, so I need to manoeuvre the aircraft to avoid the traffic. In this simulation, TCAS orders one plane to climb, the other to descend. Maintain vertical speed. Maintain vertical speed. TCAS has steered the aircraft away from each other. Clear of conflict. Clear of conflict. Clear of conflict. Re-engaging the autopilot and the two bubbles in which their aircraft are sitting will move to a safe distance apart once more. Technology seems to have finally solved the problem of pilots not being able to see each other. As a direct result of the LA collision, TCAS is now compulsory on all commercial aircraft 
flying to most destinations. But the TCAS system, designed to make collisions almost impossible, would one day play a part in one of the worst collisions of modern times. Moscow, and a Bashkirian Airlines charter flight takes off for Barcelona, Spain. On board are 45 children from the Russian city of Ufa. The children have all been chosen for their outstanding artistic, academic or sporting ability. These are among the best and brightest Russia has to offer. 11-year-old Artur Kamatov is a straight-A star pupil. His proud father, Zulfat, talked to him just before takeoff. His voice was positively singing. He was happy. He said, Dad, we are boarding the plane, we are flying away soon, everything's fine. He told us not to worry, and we said goodbye. 15-year-old Linara Kishmatulin is planning to be an economist. Linara was my eldest daughter. She was very happy during the days before the trip. She was getting ready for new experiences. Also on board are Svetlana Kaloyev and her two children, Konstantin and Diana. They are looking forward to seeing their father, Vitali, who is working in Spain. I had uh, practically finished my contract, and my wife and I decided I would wait for them to join me so they could get some rest on swimming. We were just waiting for the children to finish school so that the holiday could begin. But also in the sky that day, there is a 757 cargo plane. 611 request climb flight level 360. DHL flight 611 is en route from Bergamo in Italy to Brussels. The plane with the children on board is approaching from the east. The two planes' flight plans will cross somewhere near Zurich. In the Zurich Air Traffic Control Center, the man responsible for their safety is Peter Nielsen. Number 1943 X-ray. He has a battery of modern technology at his disposal. But maintenance workers temporarily knocked out the collision warning system and some of his telephone lines. That evening, he's also the only controller on duty. At around 9 o'clock in the evening, the DHL cargo plane approaches Swiss airspace. Its British captain asks Nielsen for permission to climb through 36,000 feet. DHL 611, request climb flight level 360. Nielsen gives him the go-ahead. Dahl 611, Zurich Center, climb 18, flight level 360. Minutes later, the Bashkirian Airlines flight also calls in. It's already cruising at 36,000 feet. Radar contact, contact. Just as Nielsen takes the call, a third plane radios for help. Nielsen is now juggling three aircraft. Then a fourth plane calls in. Nielsen is under huge pressure. With nobody to help him, he constantly moves between two workstations. Bob Trott, an experienced air traffic controller has faced similar pressures. Pressures would have been uh, unbelievably high. He was using equipment which was not completely serviceable. He was operating two sectors where normally there's one person per sector. So he literally had to run around between two different radar displays trying to sort out the aircraft involved. Of course, none of this is known to the children on the Russian plane. But as they approach Zurich, their aircraft is on a collision course. 
with the DHL cargo plane. Even so, at this point, there's no cause for alarm. What's he showing? He said, you see anything there's still plenty yeah. of time to take avoiding action. But then, something goes wrong. The two planes continue to head for each other. At 9.35 p.m. local time, they collide. Burning debris litters the fields along the shore of Lake Constance. The wreckage fell towards the ground at a rate of hundreds of miles an hour, slamming into the soil just seconds after the two jets collided in mid-air. The wreckage is scattered across a four-mile area near the Swiss-German border. All 71 people in both planes die. The bodies of many of the children are unrecognizable. Those were the minutes when our lives turned upside down. I didn't want to believe it, although I immediately realized that this was our plane and our children. Nevertheless, there was some sort of hope of them being alive, because we simply couldn't believe the children had died. Today, in the Russian town of Ufa, there's a memorial to the children in the city cemetery. It's part Muslim, part Christian. Zulfat Kamatov lost his academically gifted son, 11-year-old Artur. He's still in shock. Even now, we still can't believe they're dead. We live in the anticipation that they have gone somewhere and will return someday. And it will probably feel this way for as long as we live. We barely saw their bodies, so to us, they are still alive. Batir Kishmatulin lost his 15-year-old daughter, Linara. She was hoping to study economics. I used to think that I'd begin to forget, but I still hear her voice in my ears. And how she said, Papa, all of this is forever and unforgettable. At the crash site, there's a puzzle the investigators need to solve. With each plane equipped with TCAS, how could the collision have occurred? Slowly, they piece together an extraordinary story of misunderstanding. As the two aircraft drew close on that fateful evening, the TCAS instruments on both planes locked onto each other by radio. On board the Bashkirian flight, TCAS told the Russians to climb. 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 At almost the same moment, the DHL system ordered a descent. 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 The system was working just as it was meant to, and the planes should now move apart. But then, suddenly, the air traffic controller in Zurich, Peter Nielsen, working alone and still juggling too many planes, caught up with what was going on. He could see on his radar the two planes approaching each other. Unaware the anti-collision systems had kicked in, he ordered the Russians to descend, directly contrary to what TCAS had ordered. 
Bastion, you're 2973. Descend and expedite, expedite. The Russian crew face a dilemma. Should they obey the machine and climb, or the controller and descend? The Russian pilots, for all of their previous experience, they were duty-bound, morally bound, felt bound to follow the air traffic controller's advice. Probably this was the first time that they had ever been faced with a conflict where their common sense and their experience told them to follow the air traffic controller and their aeroplane was telling them to do the opposite. The Russian captain ordered a descent. Meanwhile, the DHL plane obeying TCAS also descended. The two planes fly straight into each other. The final German crash report blames the Zurich Air Traffic Control Company for poor management. Maintenance work should never have been allowed to interfere with the function of the air traffic control equipment. Nor should Peter Nielsen have been working alone. Four company executives are found guilty of manslaughter. But the most important finding is more fundamental. The report starkly highlights the fact that while TCAS has replaced the need for pilots to look out for each other, Nobody has ever resolved what happens when there is a conflict between TCAS and a controller. In the future, to avoid collisions, all pilots are told to obey TCAS, no matter what the controller says. The worldwide opinion now, right across the industry, is that if you get a TCAS warning, you must follow that. It was absolutely drummed into all of our pilots now that that is the first corrective action you take. As a result of the Zurich collision, such calamities should be avoidable in the future. But for one man, all this is irrelevant. Vitaly Kaloyev has lost his wife and two children on that same plane. He's the first of the relatives to reach the crash site. The experience is traumatic. As I drove up to the headquarters of the rescue operation, I saw the bodies of children lying near the road. I went into shock when I saw those bodies torn apart. For about half an hour, I couldn't move my arms or my legs. Kaloyev insists on being allowed to take part in the search for bodies. My little girl was probably identified first because she was the smallest body, the smallest one. When they showed me where the plane had fallen, there was a big tree there. She had probably fallen into the tree, and the branches had helped break her fall a little. I saw at once that some of her hair had become stuck in the tree. I took it down. Then I put my hands on the spot on the ground where she'd fallen. I stroked it and felt some objects. I picked them out and it was the beads she'd worn around her neck. Back in his hometown of Vladikavkaz, the horror starts to fester. He wants justice. 
In its place, the Swiss air traffic control company offer compensation. But Kalayev doesn't want money. He wants somebody to take responsibility for what's happened. And he wants an apology. For two years, he waits for somebody to say sorry. Finally, he loses patience. They kept me dangling and refused my requests. So I said, OK, wait for me. I'm coming without invitation. Two years after the disaster, he returns to Zurich. Somebody is going to pay for the death of his family. He checks into a hotel, close to the home of the air traffic controller, Peter Nielsen. He's brought with him pictures of his children. And he's also brought a knife. On February the 24th, he pays Nielsen a visit. He tries to show Nielsen his family pictures. But Nielsen, thoroughly alarmed, brushes them away. An argument breaks out. Kaloyev loses control. Yesterday night at about 6, 6.30, one of our air traffic controllers has been killed in his home. Kaloyev serves three years in a Swiss jail for murder and is then released. First of all, I'll go home, and then I will visit the graveyard of my children. Today, he's back in Vladikavkaz, where he's regarded by many as a hero. The story of what Vitaly Kaloyev did to Peter Nielsen was a shocking one. It brings home just how great the human cost of aircraft collisions can be. But from disasters like these, there are positive outcomes. Communication between air traffic controllers and pilots has dramatically improved. The battery of new and clever technologies have made flying safer than ever before. The management of air traffic is better and more carefully regulated. Near misses should now remain just that, misses. Yet when humans interact with machines, there is always the danger of mistakes. The battle to avoid new collisions in the future will go on.